Greetings, ladies and mantle gents. Welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Our Space, where we take stories from across the internet, read them for your entertainment. This particular story is a continuation of last night's story called The Last Human Diplomat, written by Maniacal Monocle. Lights flickered from the disrepair in the tram station for the Plains District. Reen emerged from the crowded train and climbed the stairs to a time. A discreet scanner in the wall analyzed her ID and communicated with the turnstiles to let her pass. Reen emerged into the Plains District, a section of the ring purpose made for the aristocratic class of the Rhone Tar. Grass covered every patch of black ground and vines climbed up most archways and walls. Lux's apartment in the ring was much more of an estate than Reen's. It wasn't freestanding, still linking together with a long line of houses that formed a wall around the central walkway. It did, however, have a lawn out front. Luck had filled it with all the notable flora of the Run Far, the Run Ta homeworld. Reen was the last to arrive, a thin layer of sweat on her forehead. Luck was waiting on a bench designed for her centaur-like frame, while the other invited diplomats complimented the topiary. The two other guests were Luck's assistant and the Cezine ambassador. The junior staffer appeared to be substantially younger than Luck, although Rune Tar age was still hard to gauge for Reen. His ram horns were short, barely making a half loop. Reen had been told his name once, but had never seen him after the initial introductions when he first arrived in the ring. Vesa, the Cesian, was somewhat short for her species, but still towered over everyone else. Our co-workers, Reen felt that Vesa was the closest to being called a friend. She had arrived in the ring just a few weeks after Reen successfully applied for her office in the Ambassador's Annex. Vesa had initially been too patronizing to the plight of humanity, but had shown a genuine concern for Reen's refugee constituents. Vessa's tunic was made of rich leather and had long colored stripes that flowed down the back to accent her plumage. It was sleeveless, allowing her large forelimbs flexibility to carry her body around. Her small manipulator arms were neatly at rest within the folds of an intricate undershirt. She even wore a few rings along her serpentine tail. Luck and her assistant wore rich purple covering over the hind torsos. It reminded Reen of a saddle, but she kept that comparison to herself. Luck had a silken dress with a fractaline pattern crawling across it like lightning. Her assistant wore something incredibly modest so as to not upstage his boss. Ah, thank you for waiting, everyone, Reen told them in Runtar high speech. She was trying to, uh, and fading to hide that she was out of breath. Sorry, I lost track of time at home. Luck gave a short snort that was neither rude nor forgiving. Reen dipped her head slightly to Luck, and the junior staffer returned a similar nod. The social display seemed to please Luck and reinforce the desired hierarchy. Luck did not travel on the ring's public trams and would not degrade her guests by having them do so either. She had chartered a shuttle that left from her affluent neighborhood and would take them 60 degrees along the ring to the Yonk College. It was a well-decorated and automated shuttle, with almost all its fuselage committed to passenger comfort. Windows covered much of the ceiling and walls. It was not a machine that Reen would trust in open space. The vessel was of Runtar make, and the seats were likewise fitted to their physiology. While it was overly spacious for Reen, Vesa had a difficulty fitting her body between the floor and the ceiling. Now you are right, Vesa. Reen asked the Cezine as she winched herself sideways into a tiny couch. Oh, oh don't worry about me, Vesa replied. She scrunched her neck back into her torso, which ruffled her ridge of feathers there. She looked somewhat comical and Reen stifled a laugh. Vesa was in good humor and stifled the laugh herself. The trip was only a few minutes long. The shuttle took a less direct path to provide views of the ring's axial support structures and the parent sun, pale yellow. Reen had been disappointed that the star hadn't been given a more poetic name by the Rune Tar pioneers. The star system was populated exclusively by massive colorful clouds, 
rich in minerals but lacking in living space. It seemed to her that the Runtar Republic had grown so large that coming up with good names for their frontier systems just didn't matter anymore. The shuttle quickly passed out of the sunlight and into the shadow as it docked with the station. They emerged just a moment later from the cramped shuttle into the nauseatingly spacious Yonk College. The college took up a full five degrees of the ring and was designed to make you forget that you were on an artificial station. The ceilings were either painted or covered in vid screens which played looping footage of cold blue and auburn sky. Buildings did not stretch floor to ceiling. In fact, the multi-floor design of the ring had surrendered here to a single dominating reality that was the college. It made Reen feel like she was falling. Yonks walked along the foliage-lined paths between buildings made of brick and wood. Small fauna flit on insect-like wings or scurry up and down the tree lines. It was an impressive display of wealth from the Imperium. It was an excessive use of Ring's resources to propagate this planet's side facade. It was propaganda. It was working. Their host was an elderly representative of the college. Rumor had it that even though he was nearing 200 years old, he was sure pick for the college's next dean. He had initially taken the faculty position as a retirement jump after his war service. Luck had talked at length about how a college dean was something worth more as an ally than a dozen primes. Her goal over dinner was to make a notable ally just as they became important. The college architecture was ostentatious in its design and building materials. Everything was constructed, no prefabs. Each building was given a wide berth from its neighbors. Maintaining such large open spaces was a display of wealth on par with a gold toilet. And wood, whether fabricated or cut, was outrageously expensive. Reen already felt guilty about the wood in her office and apartment. The college did not have such reservations. A young yonk with no scion markings and a light blue shelled hyphen approached them as they walked the grounds and offered to escort them to the college's reception hall. The hyphen spoke Imperium Standard through a vocalizer on the top of his barrel-shaped body. Theirs was a species Reed was still not comfortable with. They completely lacked a face and glided along with a single slug-like foot. In a head, they registered more as an animal than a person. The social dynamic between the young and hyphen was obvious. The hyphen was not a student here, but a slave. The college likely owned at least many hyphen out to these young students. These collegiate hyphen were all some variety of servant, either note-takers or maids. The diplomats could not see the few of them scooting around the grounds, collecting trash or dutifully following a student. It was difficult for Reen to conceptualize the hyphen as a people but it was a courtesy the Imperium denied them by design. Square columns of steel and stone adorned the entrance to the reception hall. Inscriptions in Imperium standards spoke of the power and longevity of knowledge. The intimidating architecture seemed to banish the friendly Yonk and his servile hyphen. The diplomats were the last to arrive. A small crowd of Yonks milled about in the impressively decorated antechamber. Portraits of previous college deans lined the walls. Hyphen, with crisp white fabric fixed to their shells, was silently offering up refreshments and scented vapors. The whole scene reminded Reen of old earth vids, of black tie backroom speakeasies, although the complete lack of humans beside herself made the comparison thin. Luck led the charge, introducing herself and then her guests to their host, a pale and heavily marked scion named Barrett. Barrett likely had a scion score in the high triple digits. Reen had been told that fellow scions were able to read the markings and interpret the score instantly. She only knew that the more intricate and extensive the markings, the more prestigious the yonk, and the more dangerous, she thought to herself. Small talk and the reception hall was short-lived. It appeared that the dinner as well as the other guests had been waiting for the diplomats. Not long after introducing themselves to their host, the doors to the dining room were opened. The central event of the evening was to be the classic Yonk-style dinner. Contrary to their species' reputation as Loda Erudites, 
Yonk festivities were long, involved social events. By tradition, dinner was always served across multiple tables, kept small to encourage conversation. The host was expected to stay at one table, and the guests were expected to rotate through the room to their liking. Being too stationary was seen as being a boring curmudgeon, while being too mobile was looked on as flightly or vapid. The evening's attendees were mostly yonks, with many faculty from the university attending alongside some minor politicians from the Imperium. There was a Kirin fleet marshal, as well as a Halutis deputy director, bureaucrat in attendance. In total, there were ten tables, each with six seats. They were not expected to always fill a table, but never to let one grow empty. The hierarchy was instantly visible to Reen. The Holoitus, despite being a deputy director, was woefully out of space amongst the two-meter-tall crowd of intellectuals. The Yonks were quietly making sure that she felt lesser. The host had provided universal benches for all the attendees, but notably, the chairs did not include a roosting rest for the Holoitus physiology. The kitchen staff were mostly hyphen, with some Vartis mixed in. The food smelled great, infused with the rich spices and heat that Yonks preferred. Reed had moved tables twice by the time the food was finally brought out. They served her a first course she could only describe as spicy oatmeal, with what looked and tasted like seaweed flakes mixed in. At her current table were three Yonk faculty and the Haloitas deputy. The Yonks had been going on and on about economic activity along the DMZ. The arrival of food distracted the youngs and allowed Reen an opportunity to talk to the Haloitis. Do you really think piracy is that big of a deal in the DMC? The Haloitis looked surprised that someone was talking to her. Well, piracy is a constant in the universe, like gravity, she replied in a musical accent. You can never really eliminate it, just prepare for it. But... I don't think that a few caravans raided in the last months warrant ending two millennium worth of ceasefire. One of the Yongs looked up from their bowl of soup and quipped, Well, more like a century's worth. The Haloitis frills raised in embarrassment. She dipped her head and pecked at her plate of seeds. Reen took the comment in stride and continued to address the Haloitis. So do you think traders should simply arm themselves when in the DMZ? Yeah, I think the fighter or two following in the four ship's wake is a far cry from putting an armed patrol fleet in the DMZ, the deputy director replied. The rude zonk was still staring at Reen, hoping to elicit a response. The Haloitis' feathers continued to stand on end. Recent military excursions in the zone aside, putting a patrol fleet in the DMZ will only serve to raise tensions and scare a few pirates. Certainly not worth the risk. Another yonk decided to chime in. Ha! <laughs> Political philosophy from a clerk! The DMZ has been too sacrosanct for too long. Pirates view it as an open invitation to hide there. The deputy's feathers began to calm as the yonks took control of the conversation. Two possibilities exist. Either there is a pirate planet or there is not. If there is, then the solution is to find and burn it. If there is not, then we simply must be more vigilant at part and weed them out. Another yonk interjected with an esoteric rebuttal, and Reen took this as a sign to move tables, taking her bowl of spice oatmeal with her. One table closer to the host, she found Vesa and yet more yonks. This table had a densely marked scion, and the only student in attendance. She was conspicuously the only of her species without scion markings in the room. The Chiron Marshal had just left, and Vesa was talking about post-commonality literature. You're judging the first generation too harshly. When you've been required to follow forms for so long, it makes sense that you'd flock to the abstract, Vesa said to the scion. But, uh, you have to admit that some of Gira's treaties is borderline unreadable. Ending and starting sentences at random. Some of the pages were handwritten, the scion replied. No argument here, but 
I understand where gear is coming from. I've read pre-commonality prose, and it makes me nauseous, like automated number readouts. Vessa laughed to herself in that deep, trilling sound that made Reen feel at ease. What about human literature, Reen? Any notable phases of formlessness? Reen was both thankful and mortified to be included in the conversation so swiftly. Well, uh, that's the difficult question, isn't it? If it has a name, doesn't that mean that it has form? The scion flared a gills in annoyance and decided to switch tables. Reen continued to her audience of now just the student and Vessa. There was a movement called postmodernism. I've never been a huge fan, but a few people I know call it the only honest literature. The young student was intrigued. And what is the style of the Hume's postmodern movement? Oh, well, I'm not a literature expert, but there was no one way to write. It sounds similar to what Vassa was describing, Reen said. The student now looked fully intrigued. Again, I am not hugely familiar, but one type of poetry was, sorry, is a stream of consciousness. You simply write exactly what is coming from your mind as you go. No real structure, end goal, or point. Just exactly what comes to mind. Vesa and the student looked horrified. Vesa blinked her eyes a few times, clearly lost in the grounding meditation. The student kept their eyes on the dinner bowl for a long moment. It was Vesa who finally returned to the moment and asked, So, uh, just write exactly what comes to mind, as it comes to mind. That sounds horrifying. Well, perhaps I'm speaking the Imperium Standard sloppily, but the style really only reads like a poorly edited monologue. Reen tried to reassure the table. Vesa was still visibly uncomfortable, but asked, Ah, I've been meaning to ask, uh, do humans have imperfect memories? The student stared down at their food, clearly upset by the thread that Vesa was pulling. Reen absentmindedly looked to nearby tables, hoping for a new guest to rotate in. She had no choice but to answer the question, unaware of the faux pas she was making. Well, no. Memory is a skill and is highly variable among humans. It also takes up multiple forms. The new info did seem to garner the student's interest. But if you mean precise memory... Some humans have what's called photographic memory. So, uh, what do you see when you remember things? The student asked. Well, I don't really see anything. I can somewhat picture something in my mind, but for me, it doesn't always come with clarity. Vesa and the student nodded. The table felt much less tense. Then Reen didn't know why. The student began to lead the conversation, asking Vesa about her history in politics and how she'd come so far from the nest. Another yonk joined their table, and the topic shifted to Shazine's spacecraft. Reen stayed at the table until her oatmeal was nearly gone, and then stood to hand it to a hyphen waiter. She saw her opportunity to finally join the host's table, and took it. Barrett was emptying what looked like his second bowl of pasta, while Luck discussed the Duro border crisis to a crowd of bored-looking yonk diplomats. It is the inconsistency of it all that maddens me. One day, I'll have a formal trade agreement from a clan, and the next day, I get a call the same clan has raided a caravan. <laughs> That's what you get for trading with brutes, Barrett replied with fish meat still in his mouth. What do you expect, Luck? They are barbarians with warp drives. The blatant racism definitely shocked Luck, and she did a meager job of hiding the fact in her passive face. I'd take an honest brute over a lying sophisticate. Barrett ignored her comment and charged forward with a rant that had clearly been brewing. The problem with the Duro as a culture lack hierarchy and discipline. He took a triumphant slurp of his stray noodle for dramatic effect. When no one challenged him, he continued with confidence. Each clan acts as its own, unconcerned with the needs of the whole. Their leaders pursue the fleeting desires of the day with little control or <laughs> oversight over the rabble. When a clan leader can be deposed by a simple challenge... What level of stability do you think that provides? No luck. The only way to communicate with the Dero is with threats. 
Luck did not see an easy way out of the situation, and so gave a non-committal huff. The other youngs at the table nodded their heads in subservient agreement with their host. Reen wore disbelief across her face. The host and table quickly noticed that Reen was the only one not to voice a response to Barrett's condemnation of the duro. A row of bulbous eyes and Luck's beady set of four eyes came to rest on her. That familiar feeling of otherness rose in her stomach. She had to say something, anything. I'm not so sure. Her rebuttal garnered her a moment of shock and a narrow window of to formulate an inoffensive political position. Barrett's comments were a red-hot poker to her temper. She knew escaped members of the Jiro slave caste and their first complaints were not lack of hierarchy and discipline. With few options, she had to lie and find a middle ground between herself and a racist. The Jiro are a confederation, are they not? I think that shows that their fear of tyranny more than their lack of discipline. Each clan wants an independence from each other. Well, that may not be hierarchical. I don't think that it shows lack of discipline. Green had partially convinced the young diplomats. Barrett was annoyed to have been contradicted at his own event, at his own table. I know members of their caste system, and their commitment to discipline nearly matches the Imperium's. She could see Barrett cool down ever so slightly. <laughs> well, then perhaps not discipline, but consistency, Barrett said. The major thrust in his argument was intact, as was his pride. The conversation was still up for a moment, and Luck saw an opportunity to take the steering wheel again. She'd been at the host table for a little too long, and had maybe one more opportunity to ingratiate herself with Barrett. A Vertes waiter walked near the table and saw the number of empty or emptying bowls. He made quick eye contact with Barrett, Reen, and the other youngs at the table to confirm their readiness for more food. Luck's plate was barely touched. Reen slowly slipped the tiny disc of poison from her dress pocket and split her mind into two focuses. One was playing the part of an impartial and polite dinner guest, happy to be at the host's table. The other was watching the door to the kitchen and discreetly unwrapping the poison. She kept her hands below the table and slowly peeled away one side of the plastic baggie. Surface tension kept the other half of the plastic stuck to her now sweaty left palm. The Vartese waiter appeared not long after his disappearance with four balls balanced between his six arms. His rodent-like face expressed a worry born both of the balance and the heat of each ball. He came to the yonk to Reen's right first and happily exchanged a steaming bowl of soup for a cold, empty one. As he twisted to deliver Reen's meal, she moved her foot slightly to trip one of his spindly legs. He fell and shot out one of his arms to steady himself on the table. In doing so, he nearly dropped the full bowls of food he still carried. Reen took the opportunity to grab hold of two arms and helped him stand again. In that instant, she helped him rise. She slipped her arm over the one bowl of pasta he carried and let the poison drop. The swish of her dress and the minor chaos of the fall helped to obscure her delivery. The Vartis thanked her and delivered her another bowl of spiced oatmeal. He offered a meager apologies. Sorry, Shires, I was too ambitious to deliver them all at once. Barrett did not offer a response. His barbels dangled from his face as he smacked his mouth in anticipation of another bowl of pasta. Reen saw the tiniest tip of the poison disc bobbing in the bowl. She hoped the pale blue would be lost in the rainbow of exotic ingredients present in the dish. Reen had to wrestle her attention away from the other's food and forcefully concentrate on eating casually. Luck thankfully provided an unintentional distraction as she talked Barrett's ear holes off. It was clear that she had pushed her luck this evening and was skirting ever closer to annoying the host. Luck picked up her tray of grains and fruit when it became obvious that Barrett was more interested in eating than talking. Luck decided to surrender and pushed a chair back from the table, signaling she was finally going to rotate elsewhere. She tried her luck one last time, however, and moved her hand into Barrett's personal space, offering up her contact card. Mel... If you ever need to discuss getting things past the border, I know a lot of caravan houses, she said. Barrett eyed the card with derision, but ultimately took it from her. 
He flipped it over in his hand a few times and then used the edge to wipe a bit of food from the side of his mouth. He smiled and his gills fluttered in boasting. <laughs> Certainly, Luck, I'll always keep you in mind. One of the other youngs at the table chuckled and Luck took the indignity in stride. With that, she was gone to some other table, nursing her pride. Reen remained at the table, committed to watching the coming fiasco. It came maybe a minute after Luck made her ignominious exit, and right as the young student sat down. At first, it looked like Barrett was choking, but a young's breathing and eating tubes are separate. He pounded his chest with his fist and tried to cough out through his gills. He started to stand, but his arms felt weak. He shook a little in his chair while his eyes bulged in his head. His scion markings felt hot. They felt, oh, so hot, hotter than being in the chair almost two centuries ago. He could feel the needle poking at his skin while the proctor and the machine barked questions at him. Memories broke into a conscious mind and he didn't have the strength to stop them. His mouth felt dry as the sensation of the past overloaded his brain and he started to hallucinate. How long had he been in the chair? Had it been two minutes or an hour? What was his score? What would he look like when the test was finally done? The machine drew a long line across his abdomen. It burned like a molten metal in his skin. He'd never told anyone, but he was worried that he'd be ugly once the test was over. What was the last question? Something about time distortion in an L3 point between three moving black holes. Could he ask for repeats? Couldn't remember. Oh no, he hadn't been breathing. Was the test over? He was on the bridge of the dutiful. Some marshal was reading off casualty reports while the Scion War Council looked over a hundred reports a second. His head felt woozy and he skimmed through satellite images. Someone was saying his name, but he couldn't quite hear them. His arms felt weak. How high up were they? Was this orbit safe? Did humans even have any orbital defense missiles left? How much longer was this madness going to last? It needed to end. He was so tired. Why was he so tired? He was back in the college reception hall, and there was no oxygen making it to his brain. Barrett thrashed at the table as his skills turned a dark red. He tried over and over to cough. The yonk next to him was trying desperately to smack him on the back and make him cough. But Barrett was moving around too much, trying to grab something like an idiot child. He started clawing at his gills, trying to get the air in them and the clotting blood out. He needed to clear his airway. He needed someone to strike him just in the middle of his back, where the minor lungs connected to the pulmonary branch of his gills. Why wasn't anyone helping him? Was he having an allergic reaction? It wasn't the air. Nothing was that quick, and some other yonk would have been affected as well. Was it something in the food? Yeah, it couldn't be. Half the yonks had ordered the same dish. Lux business card. He wiped it right on his mouth. Foolish, terrible discipline next to a foreign agent. Barrett was standing back from the table while a fellow yonk nearly punched him in the back. It didn't solve the problem. Blood was starting to drip from Barrett's overinflated gills. They already sustained enough damage that he'd need a transplant anyway. His eyes darted around the room frantically until he found luck. He jumped at his table and clawed at the business card. His arms were starting to grow rigid. Each movement looked pained and false. He had to steady himself on the table with both of his arms as strength left his legs. His species' double-jointed arms didn't ever truly lock in place, so he quickly fell. His face impacted the bowl of pasta with force enough to knock over the table. In the chaos, he had managed to get a grip on the card. A mess of food and blood splayed out around his now convulsing body. He clawed around to orient himself facing luck. With her eyes locked, he took a business card and smacked it over and over on his now shattered dinner bowl. The crowd stood back, so shocked at their hectic display that no one moved for a moment. A host of servants from the kitchen had appeared and were trying to administer first aid. Their efforts were in vain. Barrett had stopped moving. His last actions were clear to the guests assembled. He had condemned luck. The table of Yonks had seen her hand over her business card shortly before leaving the table. They 
had seen him wipe it on his mouth. Her embarrassment and her foreign status were all they needed to condemn her. No one said anything, but they all stared at her. Vesa moved up next to Reen, as did Lux's assistant. They knew that they had to condemn her immediately if they were going to make it out of the college. Luck took the stares of the crowd like a criminal on the way to the gallows. She took out her data slate and called the Runtang consulate off of the ring. Uh, hello, yes, this is Lucka. I am requesting diplomatic privilege. The crowd began to stand in a wall between the exit and Luck. You can check the record of my blood. I've earned the right, she continued over the call. The Yonks began to look toward the Chiron fleet marshal as the authority figure in the room. At first he was confused, then moved into the role of a military commander. Madam Luck, if you would, I am placing you under arrest for the murder of Sion Barrett, his vocalizer announced in a commanding Imperium standard. It took a second for her ambassador's translator to deliver the Chiron's command. Luck stood rigid as a soldier and ended her call. Reen had to summon a Herculean strength to suppress her grin. But to her benefit, no one in the room was looking at her. She gifted herself the enjoyment of beholding the now-deceased Scion Barrett, the former head war scion for the War of Human Pacification, lay in a puddle of pasta and his own blood. The last scion calculation he ever made was wrong. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.